world, they have so many problems in world politics, which were causes of wars, then now the descendants of those warriors, those who stayed alive, look, look back to them with a smile, etc. But this hasn't been that, and we are seeing a very vicious war, a hundred years after that meeting, being conducted now with dozens of people being killed every day. And in the first few days of the war, it was even more than that. We have the threat of ethnic cleansing. We have had ethnic cleansing in the first stage of the war, which has not been solved for 30 years, etc. So it just seems that it failed. So as our interview nears its end, there's a question that I think every historian would love. How sticky do you think are general, uh, generational values, generational culture transmitted into the future? So how sticky is the Soviet Union to today? And how relevant is the thinking today? That's a very difficult thing to say because it depends on what aspect of your culture you're talking about. Uh, my perception is of a historian who has grown up as an mi ethnic minority in another country, uh, comes from, on the mother's side, from a family which was leftist. So although my mom didn't join any party, my grandparents were. Uh, so some kind of this even mythical notion of supporting the causes of the left, including internationalism, etc., does play a role in my upbringing because they thought that these were good things. The way they told, for example, the Vietnam War or uh, the struggle of Nelson Mandela in our own home, these were all things that were to be uh, positive things, etc. Uh, then, as a historian looking at it, uh, I see that the Soviet historiography, the way it was uh, passed on to the post-Soviet generation uh, has had its problems. Uh, and uh, I, I'm not saying that we should, uh, again, create an image of everything was fine kind of situation, which sometimes, you know, Western historians do. Uh, but uh, there is much more room for looking at all these problems uh, and try to see where the problems are and try to give voices to the others, etc. And in that sense, I see that what is being produced is sometimes very, very harmful. Very harmful in the sense that it creates an image of us always being right, negating the other, uh, not respecting the other's culture. Uh, for example, I, I don't know if an, an intellectual person in Azerbaijan, for example, how do they look at that images that we saw of their soldiers destroying that huge cemetery in uh, in Jura or in Julfa? I I cannot see a solution. This is one example. I'm sure Azerbaijanis make uh, uh, they can give other examples where Armenians did uh, wrong things, and I'm not saying that Armenians never don't know any mistakes, but things like this, that this problem cannot be solved until we sincerely apologize for this. As I said, I cannot see a museum of the history of Yerevan without saying that, no, in this city, there were a lot of Muslims living. It doesn't mean that all of them were killed. Uh, some left, as I said, because of that glass ceiling, others left in 1988 because of the pressures, but also the problem is that more Armenians came into the area, and so the numbers overwhelmed them in the sense that, you know, uh, percentages also uh, declined because most of the new influx to Yerevan was an Armenian influx, etc. But that doesn't really negate the fact that in the city of Yerevan, uh, there was a substantial Muslim presence, and you cannot deny that aspect of your history or gloss over it. The same thing for Baku. Yeah, You have to say that up until 1990, there were Armenians in Baku. I have friends who married Armenian women from Baku, and these uh, women went to school in Baku. They have their own experiences, etc. In the 19th century, in the oil boom of Baku, you know, Armenians were not the most prominent, but they played an important role in the in, in the, uh, an important role. So they were like like the nobles or the much richer Russian entrepreneurs, but they were there as well. Some of the Armenian philanthropists actually made their money in Baku. Kalus Gulbengian had uh, some kind of involvement in Baku oil, etc. You have to talk about these things. Uh, that there were villages in Armenia where Armenians used to live. There are villages in Azerbaijan that 
are uh, sorry, uh, Azerbaijan used to live. There are villages in, uh, in, in Azerbaijan today outside the Karabakh area, depopulated, where Armenians used to live. If we don't accept that we live together at some stage and respect one another's culture, talk about all the problems, but without that kind of grudge about those problems, we can also not have a compromise solution on this. But the way the war is going on up until now is that one side, at least at this stage, wants total victory. And uh, I hope that uh, if the Karabakh problem is going to be solved, it will be solved by compromise. Because without compromise, a victory over one side will not end enmity. I told this in the Yerevan interview last year. Some people were unhappy, but I'm still to that. Because if one side achieves full victory, the enmity doesn't end. Uh, and we have to think of uh, living together because neither the Armenians will jump on hot air balloons and go up, and other Azerbaijanis will jump on hot air balloons and go to another country. And uh, ultimately, people have to live together. But in order to live together, we have to be honest together. We have to respect one another, but we also have to say that there are problems. Some of the European approach is that they want to create a counter narrative by only emphasizing the good. Okay, that is not always okay if you don't give the whole complexity of the situation. I understand that any counter narrative which emerges initially, of course, will emphasize one thing which the main master narrative does not mention. But ultimately, the counter narrative is also problematic because something merging the two would come to show the complexity of the situation. And uh, we're not there yet. And what has been happening in the last five weeks is actually harming what's happening. There is so much hate. You know, uh, and that that it's, I don't know what will end. Let alone all those young people who are dying. All those young people who are dying, all those young dreams that are being broken. Believe it or not, even when I see that poor Syrian person captured by the Armenians, being interrogated in a language which I understand very well, you know, and I was thinking what I would have told this guy if I show him, I said, What are you doing? المجموعتين هذول كبير شو كانت المجموعتين هذوليك من مين مؤلف سوريين كمان سوريين كله سوري كله شو عم بتضيع انت معي ها شوي لا عم بتقول لي 200 واحد كنا بعدين عم بتقول لي ثلاث محاور كل مجموعه 200 يعني 600 واحد سوري اللي كنت انا معها ايه 200 واحد ايه وعساس قالوا لنا انه الامتحان ثلاث محاور ما بعرف اللي عم يضحكوا علينا مشان يهرطونا كان الغازات اللي بيجيبونا بيقولوا لنا هاي الضيعه وفين هزموا في عالم بعمره ما ماسكه بارود Why have you come to kill another person that you don't know and you're putting your life at stake here Because ultimately I know a lot of Syrian people I know that there are parts of Syria where people are poor I know some of them come to Lebanon and work I know how hard some of them work. So that they, because somebody is giving you money to go and kill another person that you don't know, which means that you have, I don't know, your poverty has actually led you to do what? So we're, we're really living in, in, in a world that, I don't know, how can we solve? But as I said, it's so difficult at this stage. Because uh, ultimately, you have to live in order to preach coexistence. That's another problematic thing. I have to live to preach coexistence. If I die and they, people kill me, then the victorious person will say, okay, we won. And there's no need for coexistence. Thank you very much for no your problem. insightful reflections, yeah. words of wisdom, yeah. and evident expertise on the topic. Um, I would like to turn the floor to you. Do you have any concluding remarks for the day? Do you want to greet anyone? And I'm sure, hands off, that we will be back for a second conversation. When I look back to World War I, I see two very contrasting images. In 2014, on the 100th anniversary, the French and the Germans did something which I hope one day the Armenians and Azerbaijanis will do. 
they erected a joint monument on the battlefield for all the people who died. And we know how many hundreds of thousands died on those battlefields. Uh, usually, mostly French, German, British, and Belgian, yeah, and some others. But these were the, the brunt were these four nationalities. But unfortunately, that's not the way things necessarily do happen. At the same time, in Sarajevo, an academic conference collapsed on day one because it's still Bosnians and Serbians cannot agree on whether Gavrilo Princip was right or wrong to try to assassinate Franz Ferdinand. It's the same time distance, same war. In one sense, it's so good that so much has healed. And let us remember that there was another vicious war a few years later during World War II, which went on for another four or five years, which pitted German against French again. As much as I want uh, one day Armenians and Azerbaijanis to do like the French and the Germans, because I have always believed that this problem could have been solved by diplomacy. If both people had less hubris and worked more on the practicalities, I know that uh, at the moment I am as utopian as Thomas More when he was writing that book 500 years ago. Uh, but uh, I always like utopian literature because they are sometimes the dynamos which make people think about better times. I am hoping that one day there will be a peaceful world and one day we can celebrate that there's nothing wrong in being Christian. There's nothing wrong being in, in Muslim. There's nothing wrong in speaking Armenian. There's nothing wrong. And we should essentially find a way so that these problems of today will be accepted with a smile by the next generations. Uh, but will that happen? As I said, I'm not a rich person, I'm not putting any bet on it, unfortunately. But in this moment, I think we should have to maintain our humanity, even in this madness of war. Uh, and I really dislike all Armenians and all Azerbaijanis who write that the other side should be eliminated or the other side is not good or whatever, etc. Even if you're fighting on principle, have in mind that basically sooner or later, hopefully, you will sit down. Maybe those negotiations will be as difficult as this war. But at least during those negotiations, young people will not die. I don't know about those Syrian mercenaries. As I said, I, I have a very different attitude towards them. But at the end, unlike maybe in Armenia, because I know Syria, because I know that no people goes to kill another person if he has a decent income, or very, very, very few people do. Uh, that's why I think that those people are also being exploited by others, uh, simply because the economic system in Syria, a country very close to my heart, Next to Lebanon, I have gone made dozens of visits to Syria. I have seen many monuments in Syria because I, Syria is such a rich country in, in historic monuments, etc. I, I visited so many of them. This was before the war, of course, uh, and you know uh, has turned its citizens instead of you know being decent people working in their villages, uh, you know, uh, producing agriculture for which Syria has always been very famous in its history, etc., even has good light industry compared to other countries in the Middle East, etc. Uh, in the midst of civil war, it's uh, some of its people so poor and hungry that ultimately they're ready to go and say, oh, you know, they told me if you cut the head of an Armenian, they will give me $100. If that person had a $300 income, he would not do that. He would not do that. Uh, but uh, I don't know. As I said, 
this is that when the war starts, essentially it's time to fall silent. Because uh, uh, as much as I wrote about, uh, had all these ideals, I know realistically that the time is not for people like me. Uh, I know that this time is for generals uh, and, and other things. And uh, I just hope that all of us remember that one day we will sit down on the table. When that will be, I don't know. I gave the example of uh, Bosnia and uh, Serbia to just say that what happened within the Germans and the French is not inevitable, you know. Other entities do continue. Um, but the sooner the fighting stops, the fewer young people will die. And for me, that's, that's, that's the most important thing. And then, I don't know. Uh, in the negotiations table, unless people are creative to find some compromise solutions, this statements of territorial integrity, right to self-determination that people have been harping on for 30 years and defining it as exact opposites of one another, it's not bringing any solution. So who is that creative person which will come out with uh, some other kind of function? And this is where the West has failed as well. The West has failed by not encouraging new ideas uh, so that maybe some, some new idea will make it possible to solve not only the Karabakh issue, but at least there are a dozen or so other Karabakhs in the world, you know, unrecognized territories which have problems with the titular nationalities, and they are on many continents in the world. They're not, they're not only in the former Soviet space. Uh, and how we are going to deal with this issue, uh, which has become a serious problem in international law and international relations. Uh, well, as if I'm talking like a preacher in the end, but uh, saying that I hope that wiser minds will prevail. My experience with Armenians is there are three adjectives, hopeful, persistent, courageous, describing the new generation. And to be creative, you need these attributes. And so that should give us hope that there can be a mutual agreement that As I said, I don't expect that agreement to be easy. Yes. Yeah. But isn't it better to spend your energies of your mind yes. on the table I and really not kill don't. one another really? uh, instead of buying weapons and killing one another? So that, that's my whole... Uh, but ultimately, we're still living in a world where the international system is broken down. I was talking to a former diplomat yesterday, he said, who will give Karabakh the security guarantees? Is their international system? And that's also a very serious, serious problem. So as I said, uh, it will be easy for Westerners to say, oh, these are all two old tribes, they fight and we cannot solve the problem. And this is a very good refrain that we hear often, but essentially West should realize that it is problematic because it created nationalism in the modern sense and exported it to the rest of the world. Now it thinks that it's old fashioned, something that it was its own creation. And it's not really thinking in the way of trying to come out with or helping, really helping to come out with uh, solutions and, and other things. Uh, so that's it. Uh, what can I say? I hope the people in Karabakh will be able to stay in their own homes. I hope as many Azerbaijan refugees will be able to return to their homes as possible. And I hope that there should be a really working solution. I know it's not going to be easy. It may happen or it may not happen. Uh, but uh, I think that's the only way uh, that you can have this. People should actually be flexible in the negotiations in order to earn the trust of the other side, you should see that you are ready to make compromises. And then of course, the other way around as well, unless both sides show willingness to make compromises, negotiations will not move forward. But as I said, at the moment, this is all utopian. Uh, and unfortunately, every day, we're just waiting and waking up in the morning, uh, listening to new news. We're getting news of young people dying on the battlefield, and that's, 
I think we could have avoided it. I don't know, I, I, I'm not sure, I'm not sure. Uh, leaders of all countries are responsible for this. Politics is problematic because in order to be a leader, you have to get elected. And, and, and politicians have no moral uh, boundaries, yeah? Just to get that extra vote. Uh, so I don't know. That's why I never decided, I never wanted to be a politician. With this call to action to civil society, we faces of Armenia say thank you for joining okay. us. Okay, all right. Thank you very much.